According to the U.S. Postal Service, each business day, on average, it delivers 167.3 million pieces of first-class mail. That's each day. Despite all of its long-standing problems, our nation's mail carrier delivers more items to our mailboxes than rivals FedEx or UPS. FedEx says it delivers an average of 16.5 million packages a day, while UPS claims daily average delivery of 24.3 million packages. I don't know about you, but to me, that sounds like a lot of stuff being sent each day. But if you think those numbers sound impressive, consider that, at least according to one source, there are 18.7 billion text messages sent each day globally. One study estimated that adults ages 35 to 44 deal with 52 text messages each day. And if you think those numbers are impressive, despite the rise in popularity of text messaging apps, the king of sent messages apparently still is email. Reportedly, 347.3 billion emails are sent each day. I'm guessing a sizable portion is spam or scams. Bottom line, we send a lot, physically and digitally. Our Bible is filled with stories of sending. God sends angels and prophets along with patriarchs and judges. He even sends dark horse candidates such as Moses, who claimed people would never listen to him, or a reluctant, rebellious person like Jonah. Our scripture readings for today include stories of being sent. Jesus sends a blind man to a pool with a name that translates to sent. And in our Old Testament text, God sends a mourning Samuel to anoint a new king, even though the current one was still alive. Quite a risky task. So today seems like a good day to talk about the topic of sent. That's as in S-E-N-T, not S-C-E-N-T. Good thing, since I still have a bit of head congestion. Glad you could join us. If anyone asks why you are watching, just tell them the Holy Spirit sent you. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Hello, and welcome to the online worship service of Robinson Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia, North Carolina for Sunday, March 19th, 2023. Well, based on the weather this past week, you might find it difficult to believe that spring begins tomorrow, Monday, at 524 p.m. The spring equinox marks the journey of the sun over the equator, giving us a day of equal hours of daylight and nighttime. With the spring beginning, we know Easter can't be far away now. Speaking of Easter, we are reviving a tradition that COVID-19 put on a hiatus for a few years, Easter lilies in our sanctuary. We are inviting you to purchase a plant for display on Easter morning, doing so in honor of or in memory of someone, just like we do with poinsettias at Christmas. We are selling the plants at $15 each. However, we have an extremely tight deadline this year. As you may already know, our longtime supplier, Ford's Seed and Plant in downtown Gastonia, is closing up shop. That means we had to find another vendor. 
Consequently, we need your order ASAP, like within the next couple of days. Please send us, you know, there we go again with sending, send us an email or give us a call today if you want to order a lily for Easter. Sorry about the short notice. A reminder that Palm Sunday is April 2nd this year. That same week, we'll be marking Monday Thursday with a service in our sanctuary. And then on Good Friday, we'll be participating in a procession of the cross going from New Hope Presbyterian to Union, to here at Robinson Memorial, and then ending the journey at Olney Presbyterian. Then, of course, on Sunday, April 9th, We'll be celebrating Easter with a sunrise service in the garden, followed by a light breakfast, and then our traditional 11 a.m. service, including the sacrament of communion. Please, mark your calendars and plan to attend. Now, let's attend to this worship service, beginning with our responsive call to worship. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Let us worship God. A Child of a King is our opening hymn for this service. Please sing along as Ashley provides the accompaniment. not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, 
and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about this promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. With this in mind, let us confess our sins before God. Loving God, we sit in the ashes of our hopes, but you see us as your beloved children. We pay strict attention to all who break the rules, but ignore the grace which is poured out upon us. We try to box you in with boundaries we can manage, but you continue to burst forth to bring newness into the world. Have mercy on us, God of forgiveness, and open our eyes to your presence among us. As you look at our hearts, May we see others in a different way, not as enemies or strangers, but sisters and brothers of the same family, kin to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. Jesus has said, As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. As we confess our sins to God in Christ's name, He intercedes on our behalf as we are awakened from death to the hope of new life. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. In 1 Chronicles we read, Everything in heaven and earth is yours, O Lord. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. One way we give thanks to God is through our gifts, tithes, and offerings. Thank you for your ongoing contributions to our church and its missions. We couldn't do it without you. If you are not doing so already, we invite you to donate. At the end of this service, we'll have our mailing address on the screen so you can send in donations. You'll also see a QR code you will be able to scan with your smartphone and it will send you to our online giving platform. Now, let's dedicate your gifts to the service of our Lord. Let's pray. As you pray for us in spite of our wayward behavior, O Christ, so also we intercede for others with the assurance of new life for them. Translate now our prayers into act of charity and peace as we offer these gifts. Let us not be content with our giving while others live a life less than fulfilled. Amen.
Our gospel reading for today comes to us from John, chapter 9, verses 1 through 12, and then verses 18 through 21. Listen now to the word of our Lord. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. But this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claim that he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man, they asked him. I don't know, he said. They still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered. And we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. Our Old Testament reading comes to us from 1 Samuel, chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab, and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shema pass by, but 
Samuel said, Nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, Send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. A little less than 25 miles from here, here being the church, on the south side of Mecklenburg County, the state of North Carolina operates a museum dedicated to the 11th President of the United States, James K. Polk. His parents owned the land, and he was most likely born there in November of 1795, the first of ten children in the family. Apparently, a frail child growing up, perhaps no one could have imagined him as the young nation's president. I'm guessing not even him. Actually, in the election of 1844, he was vying for a spot on the Democrat ticket as the vice presidential candidate. But after seven rounds of balloting without a clear candidate for president, delegates at the convention were presented with a new choice, Polk. He won the nomination on the ninth ballot, going on to be elected as president. Although both North Carolina and Tennessee, where he had served as governor, voted for his opponent. Polk was what you'd call a dark horse candidate a term for a lesser-known person who, against all the odds, emerges as victorious against a field of better-known rivals. At the beginning of the 1844 election cycle, I doubt anyone would have bet money on Polk winning. He was a dark horse. The Bible is full of dark horses including the eighth and youngest son of Jesse from Bethlehem, an unlikely choice to become king of Israel. Not many years before, the people of Israel clamored and begged Samuel for a king so their nation could be like all the other nations. Samuel was against it, but God allowed it. King Saul began his reign well enough. But it didn't take long for things to go badly. Both God and Samuel rejected Saul. Today's reading begins with Samuel still brooding over Saul's failure. God, on the other hand, is moving on. Get over it, Samuel. I've got something new for you to do. I'm sending you south to the lands of Judah. There, I want you to meet up with Jesse of Bethlehem. You are going to anoint one of his sons as the new king. Samuel, being a fallible human being, perceives a flaw in God's plan. Despite neither Samuel 
nor God liking Saul, he is still very much alive and still king. If he gets wind of this trip to Bethlehem, he's going to want Samuel's blood. I'm not sure you really thought this through, God. God doesn't get angry with Samuel. Instead, he provides him with a cover story. If someone asks what he's doing in Bethlehem, just say, I'm here to make a sacrifice to the Lord. That's his job, after all. So it shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone. And, Samuel, you won't be lying to anyone because you will conduct a sacrifice. You just don't have to tell anyone else about the rest of your mission. So God sends Samuel on his way. Now, by this time, Samuel was an old man, getting up there in years. The elders of Israel knew he wasn't going to live forever. So that's one of the reasons that they had pushed for a new king and in the end, got Saul. Well, despite his advanced years, apparently a visit from Samuel could create quite a stir among the people. Ever been in a situation where the boss at your workplace suddenly appears when normally you rarely see him or her? Oh, oh, what's wrong? Is someone in trouble? That's kind of how the elders of Bethlehem reacted upon seeing Samuel. Do you come in peace? They knew he and their king were on the outs with each other. You're not going to drag us into your feud, are you? No, no, I come in peace. We're going to have a sacrifice to the Lord. So all y'all need to get yourselves ready including you, Jesse, and be sure to bring all your sons with you to the feast. I want to meet them. Smooth, right? No one was any the wiser as to why God had sent Samuel to them. So the big event comes, and Jesse presents his oldest son, Eliab. From the text, we can surmise Eliab was a tall, handsome, strapping man. Apparently, a Hollywood casting's director's dream of a king. We all know the type, right? They just look like they ought to be in charge. Samuel must be saying to himself about now, wow, this is easier than I thought it would be. Only God hadn't sent Samuel to anoint Eliab, even if he was the oldest, perhaps the strongest, and the most handsome of the sons of Jesse. Do not consider his appearance or his height, God says, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. So, the parade of sons begins. Samuel is presented with six other siblings, none of them being more worthy than the first. Undoubtedly, with a puzzled look on his face, Samuel asks Jesse, Are you sure these are all of your sons? Well, there is the youngest, but he's out tending my flocks right now, and that seemed more important than bringing him in from the fields for a sacrifice. Why? Samuel responds, send for him. Send for him right away. No one is going to sit down or eat until all of your sons are present. Remember, no one at this gathering other than Samuel has 
any idea what's really happening. They just know they've been invited to a sacrifice with a feast. And they've got to be hungry and tired by this point. And now <laughs> they have to wait while Jesse sends for the shepherd boy. The passage ends with the boy's arrival. God's acknowledgement to Samuel that this is the one. And the anointing with oil by Samuel as the family looks on, undoubtedly still unsure what was happening. It is only at this point that the identity of this eighth son, this dark horse, was revealed. David. God has sent Samuel for this reason. Samuel had Jesse send for David. None of this occurred by chance. God sent David and all of Israel on a journey. We have the benefit of hindsight to see where this journey would take them and us. At the time, no one, not even Samuel, could have imagined how these sendings would affect the entire world just a few centuries later. Just a couple of weeks ago, on the second Sunday in Lent, our gospel passage reminded us that for God so loved the world that he sent his only son into it. From the root of Jesse, father of David, God sent Jesus into the world to save us, save us from the power of sin and death. In our gospel reading today, Jesus' disciples, upon seeing a man blind from birth, asked him whether this man or his parents sinned, causing his blindness. What makes you think this man's condition is a punishment or a mistake? Can you not see that he was sent into the world just as he is? He was sent so that God can show you part of why I was sent. I'm paraphrasing Jesus here. How easy is it for us when we encounter someone who is different, someone who may be considered disadvantaged by society, that God is in some way inflicting punishment. Well, they must have brought their troubles on themselves. What did they do wrong? What did their parents do wrong? We like finding scapegoats, don't we? And, you know, we can always find some Bible verse to justify our position about those other people's guilt. But what did Jesus do here? Playing the blame game is not the reason God sent me into the world, he declares. And by extension, he's also telling us that's not what he sends us out into the world to do either. Jesus rubs some mud on the eyes of the blind man, and then sends him to a pool by the name of Siloam, which we are told means sent. God sent Samuel to a dark horse by the name of David. God sent a blind man into the world for a much larger purpose, but not as a punishment. Jesus sends us out in his name to embrace those sent to us, just as they are, imperfect sinners needing the grace of God, just like us. It's not for us to judge them, but to be sent to share the love of God. Thankfully, God does not judge us the way we judge others. We are called upon to do likewise.
Jesus calls us to love, even those we say we hate. We have been sent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. And now let us turn our hearts and minds to the Lord in prayer. You are, O oh God, the Good Shepherd, who leads your people along still waters. You have sent your Son, Jesus Christ, into the world as the Lamb who redeems your people from their sin. He has become the light that illumines the darkness, allowing us to learn what is pleasing in your sight. Hear us then as we utter this prayer as you lead us along paths of righteousness, give to us the clarity of vision to discern the way we should go. Our spirits are eager to be faithful in Christ's name. The problems that confront us impel us to act. When we hold back for fear that we may fail, may your spirit infuse us with the courage to proceed. The issues that face us often do not lend themselves to simple solutions. May your rod and staff comfort us with the promise of your presence. As members of your household, we inherit the promise of your rest. Help us in times of reflection to discover the truth and in times of action to be more decisive and deliberate. Gracious Lord, today we ask for your special healing and prayers and comfort that they may be going to Pat Button, to Vicki, to Leanne Ferguson's family. We continue our prayers for Lee and Susie, for Judy and Elizabeth Ferris, for Scott Frady and his family. We continue our prayers for Lorraine Miller, for Jerry and Sandra, for Rick and Nancy, and Joe and Moselle, for Buster and Corinne. We pray for Adrian and Doug and Ashley, for Debbie Alt and for Darla and Lynn and Kim. We continue our prayers for Alan and Marilyn, for Ted and Mitchell and Bill, for Martin Becky and David, be with, we do pray, with Mac and Brantley, with Tiffany and Michaela. We pray for Greg Fail and Johnny Frazier, for Kay and Lorraine, for Bruce and Shirley, for Linda and Claudette, for Joyce Bell and TC, for Lauren and Ashley, for Ray Palmer and Debbie Palmer. We pray for Amber and Sherry, for Terry and Morgan, for Barbara Moses, for Henry Thomas, for Barbara Plyler, for Larry and Stephen and Jennifer, for David and Beverly, for Gary, for Jim Polk and Mark Beavers, for Ronnie Scoggins and for Carl. Gracious God, in order that the children of the earth might discern good from evil, you sent your Son to be the light of the world. As Christ shines upon us, may we learn what pleases you and live in all truth and goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, and who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power 
and the glory forever. Amen. And now, Christians, let us say to the whole world what it is that we believe that we have been sent into the world to proclaim. Please recite with me the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. One way we show our gratitude to God is through music. Our closing hymn for today is titled, For All These Things. You'll find the lyrics on your screen. We honor you, our risen Lord. We praise you, coming King. We consecrate our lives to you with thanks for all these things. And thank you for being a part of this worship service from Robinson Memorial Presbyterian. If you enjoyed it or found yourself being uplifted, we invite you to give this video a like or a thumbs up leave a comment, and be sure to share the video with others. God is sending us to spread the gospel. A reminder about ordering Easter lilies as soon as possible. And be sure to join us in person, if you can, every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. in our sanctuary. But if not, we look forward to sharing this time with you online next Sunday. Go from this place praising God, who sends us into the world to proclaim the gospel and to work for justice and peace. Give yourselves over to God's wise and gracious rule, knowing that God can be trusted to make all things work together for good, now 
and forever. And now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace, now and forevermore. Amen.